Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to give it a few more seconds for the last people uh, to log in and then we'll get started. Right. Good morning, uh, everybody. My name is Marlies, and I'll be taking you through an overview of sample preparation this morning. Uh, just a few points before we get started. Um, if everybody can please keep themselves on mute during the presentation, uh, just to avoid background noises. Um, we encourage questions. Please ask questions. Uh, on this call with me is Lance Brooks, our senior application um, specialist in cryptography. He will be monitoring the chat and answering questions as we go. Um, any questions that is left over or at the end of the presentation, there will also be some time for more questions. All right, then I think we are ready to begin. So today we are going to look at some of the most common sample preparation techniques, um, including dilute and shoot, protein precipitation, and ultimately sample prep extraction. So what is the goal of sample preparation? Why do we want to prepare our samples? Generally, sample preparation has one of the following or all of the following goals. Either one to um, switch your solvent into a solvent system that is suitable for your instrument or analysis. Um, and this could be moving away from water uh, for a GC injection, for example. It is to concentrate your sample when you're working with an analyte in very low concentrations to increase the ability to detect your compound, or probably the most popular go goal out of the three, which is to clean up your sample from in interfering matrix, matrix effects. Sample preparation might add a few extra steps to your workflow, but the, the benefits are numerous um, and include some of the below mentioned. It gives you a longer instrument lifetime by reducing wear and tear on hardware such as pumps and injection valves. It can give you longer column lifetime by reducing contaminant buildup. It reduces instrument downtime by avoiding clogging of your capillaries and wear and tear on the instrument consumables. It gives you better chromatography, increased method sensitivity, and therefore also allows you to work with lower limits of detection. Now, despite all of these benefits, there's no one size fits all approach when it comes to sample preparation. It is important that you keep the goal of your analysis in mind when deciding on the best preparation technique for your method. There's no point in going for the most specific method to isolate a single compound when you're actually interested in doing a screen. So factors that can guide you in making this decision is your analyte or analytes of interest the limits of detection and quantitation that you want to work with, your sample matrix, analytical instruments that you are planning on using, as well as the sample size that you are working with. You can also match the goal um, of your preparation with the se selectivity of each technique. So dilute and shoot would be your most um, 
your least selective technique where solid phase extraction would be your most specific um, technique to be used. So looking at sample cleanup, let's consider the matrix effect. Now, I'm not talking about the movie starring Keanu Reeves. And if it's not a movie, then what am I talking about? So the matrix effect is a general term that we use to describe problems when analyzing complex samples. The matrix um, effects can be because of endogenous compounds, that's part of your sample, um, especially in biological samples, these would be proteins or lipids, or it could be compounds introduced into your sample um, during sample handling. And plasticizers is a big one that we see in this category. It may not always be necessary to remove these compounds from your samples. Um, however, if it is starting to co-elute with your analytes of interest and changing your de detector response um, to either over or underestimate your um, analyte of interest, it is crucial to remove these interference. So ultimately, the goal of cleaning your sample is to remove the noise so you can see a clear picture of what is going on in your sample. Now, how do we eliminate or reduce the matrix effect? Well, we have two options. We can either focus on optimizing our chromatogra um, chromatographic conditions, and these um, can run into very long column runtimes, trying to separate your analyte and interfering compounds from each other. Or we can optimize the sample preparation uh, to eliminate these interference before we start analyzing our compounds. Best practice would be to remove your interfering compounds and then optimize chromatographic conditions for the shortest runtime um, and best resolution. One of the most important ear interference in biological samples are phospholipids. They can greatly affect your MS response um, and many analytes um, analyzed during MS. They're very difficult to remove because of the extra, um, the phospholipid bilayer, which is hydrophobic and hydrophilic in nature. And they are a major constituent in cell membranes. So they're quite abundant when you're working with any biological samples, such as serum, plasma, or even so plant samples. Yeah, they good morning. Good morning. Sorry, we're late. Not a problem. If you can please mute yourself and then we'll just continue. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So phospholipids causes serious iron suppression, um, especially when working with an MS detector. And this happens by um, the phospholipid competing for space on the droplet formed um, in the process of um, ionization. It has important effects on your parameters, including precision, accuracy, and limits of detection that you'll be able to use and therefore definitely recommended to um, eliminate phospholipids from your sample if you're working with a biological matrix. So this leads us to our first sample preparation technique of today, and it is called dilute and shoot. So as the name suggests, it really is only diluting your sample matrix. It does not remove any interference. And unfortunately, because of this, interferences can still build up over time in your system and cause some um, problems in your chromatography. Common chromatographic problems that you can see uh, is carryover, loss of sensitivity, iron suppression, and increased pressures. So why do we dilute and cheat then? 
It's simple, it's cheap, it's very easy to automate, and there's really no method development required. The disadvantages, however, is that there's no real cleanup and it's not selective at all. So, I have a few questions hidden in the slideshow for you, um, and I would love it if you could take some time um, and just pick the answer, put it into uh, the chat box where Lance will monitor it for us. So I'm going to give you a few seconds uh, just to read through the question and answers. So the question is, which of the following is not seen as a benefit of sample preparation? Okay, so I think we have a couple of answers already. So which of the following is not seen as a benefit of sample preparation? A, reduced instrument downtime, beta chromatography, reduced sample logging, or increased method sensitivity. Unfortunately, reduced sample logging. Even though our samples might be cleaner, we unfortunately still have all the paperwork to do. Next up, we have filtration. So filtration is a very simple and purely mechanical technique where particles above a certain size gets removed from the solution. Using a syringe filter is easy and it doesn't take very long. You simply fill the syringe with the liquid sample. And here I want to stress, there is HPLC certified syringes available to minimize the introduction of new compounds into your sample. So when you are working with a very sensitive detector like an MS or working with very critical samples, it might be advisable to consider one of these HPLC certified syringes. Then allow a small amount of air to enter the syringe as you draw up the liquid. And this is used as an air purge to minimize fluid retention when expelling the sample from the syringe. Second, you choose the correct syringe filter and twist the lear lock end of the filter securely onto your syringe. So we always recommend using lear lock syringes um, you definitely don't want syringe filters popping off while you are filtering your sample because of the pressure buildup. And lastly, um, apply gentle pressure onto the plunger and push the liquid sample as well as the remaining air through the syringe filter to maximize your sample recovery. So how do we then select the correct syringe filter for us? The syringe filter diameter is related to the capacity of the filter. It is recommended to choose the smallest syringe filter that can handle the amount of sample that you want to filter. This will ensure the least holdup volume in your syringe filter while still being able to filter your entire sample. This table that you can see here is a general um, guideline as to the volumes and diameter um, that can be expected. This is, however, something that differs from supply to supplier, and I would definitely always recommend asking your supplier both the holdup volume of a certain syringe filter as well as the filtering capacity of that syringe filter. Next, we have to consider the pore size that you are going to work with. And this will depend on both the nature of your sample 
as well as the columns particle size that you are using. So generally for more viscous samples, you are going to need either a pre-filter um, that and as well as for particulate laden samples where you want to take out um, some of the bigger particles before you get to your smaller filtering um, just to increase filter capacity. Whereas um, if you are working with GC and gas samples, you can go to your smallest syringe filter size. So when you're working with HPLC columns, um, the particle size of the column will determine the syringe filter um, pore size that you need. The smaller the flow path um, between the particles, the smaller the um, effective filter pore size that you will need to eliminate any contaminants that can block your um, column. So as a rule of thumb, any column with a particle size larger than 3 micron can use a 0.45 micron filter, whereas columns with a particle size smaller than 3 micron will always require a 0.2 micron pore sized filter. Last consideration for your syringe filter would be the uh, filter membrane that you're going to use. Membrane types are generally divided into either hydrophilic or hydrophobic membranes and will depend on the sample matrix that you are busy using. Um, so here you can see a example of a hydrophobic um, syringe membrane is PTFE, where a hydrophilic one would be regenerated cellulose. It is also very important to make sure that the membrane type you are choosing is compatible with the solvents that you are intending to use. Solvents can dissolve the membrane filter, leaving your filtration really null and void. So the advantages of fil filtering your sample, it removes particulates and this increases your column life by time because it prevents um, particulate buildup inside and on your column frets. There's less wear and tear on your instrument parts, um, such as your injector and your valves, and it reduces chances of clogging of your capillary tubing. The disadvantages is that this is still not a selective um, technique. So even though you are removing particulates that can be um, dangerous to your column and instrument, it is not actually helping you be more specific to the analyte of interest. And it does not remove endogenous proteins and phospholipids that can interfere with your detector signal. Protein precipitation. Why do we want to remove proteins? Well, if you are not intending on actually analyzing proteins, I would definitely recommend getting rid of them. Proteins have a tendency to sticking to stainless steel columns of HPLC and UHPLC columns and can build up over time, decreasing your column lifetime. It's also a major interference with MS detectors and can cause clogging of the capillaries of your instruments. So if you've ever seen milk clogging um, the nozzle of a, a milk frother, that is exactly what happens inside of your HPLC tubing um, because of the heat and solvents being used. So there's various precipitation methods uh, when we are working with protein precipitation. We have solvent precipitation that works on the basis um, of the organic solvent removing um, some of the water. This allows the proteins to interact with each other, aggregate and um, settle out of solution. This is especially suitable for uh, MS detector analysis. Then we get acid precipitation. Um, it's not a very common technique that you see in laboratories, but is based mostly on inorganic acids and halogenated organic acids. 
You can get salt precipitation. This is definitely not recommended when you're using a detector like MS because of the risk of high iron separation with the salts. You get thermal precipitation, also not a very commonly used method. And lastly, you get supported assisted precipitation. So this is similar to solvent precipitation. It works on the same principles, but instead um, of using just solvents, it has a solid phase bed that filters and retains the precipitate after centrifugation. So um, an example of one of the supported assisted precipitation is a product called Impact from Phenomenex. And these are just a few steps explaining how easy it is to use. So first you'll put in your organic solvent into your plate. You will then load your sample, vortex for two minutes, and then you can either centrifuge, vacuum, or use positive pressure to um, get your sample and the proteins will be left on the plate. Now, when you look at the cho choice of organic solvents when using protein precipitation, there's a few things to look at. Products like Impact will have their recommended solvents. But if you are choosing one of the other methods, it's important to keep in mind that it needs to be a completely water miscible solvent. It must not react with the protein. Um, it should have good precipitating pro powers and the safety of the solvent in terms of flammability, is it nauseous vapor? And um, where will you have to work with it in a fume cupboard, etc. So the advantages of protein precipitation. It's relatively simple and quick as the method that I just indicated. There's minimal method development. Um, it increases your column life lifetime and it removes proteins that can be an interferent with your detector. The disadvantages, however, is that it's still not a very selective method. Um, so it takes out the interference, but it is not specifically um, concentrating your analytes of interest. Solvent evaporation may be required and it does not remove phospholipids and salts. So time for our next question. Why is an air gap recommended when using a syringe filter? I will give you a few moments to answer. Right, so it seems like most of you have guessed it. Why is an air gap recommended when using a syringe filter? It is not to reduce pressure in the syringe while filtering. It is not to feel like a doctor when you tap the last bit of air out and it is not to place less stress on your hand when filtering. It is indeed to reduce the amount of sample left in the syringe after filtration. Then we move on to liquid-liquid extraction. So liquid-liquid extraction is also known as solvent extraction or partitioning, and it separates your compounds based on their relative solubility in two different solvents. A um, 
So the distribution coefficient um, or partitioning coefficient is a quantitative measure of how your, uh, your compound will dissolve in either organic or an aqueous state. And this just illustrates um, the uh, distribution coefficient and whether your compound is more likely to dissolve in the organic phase or the aqueous phase. And this ultimately is then the basis of the sample preparation technique. So firstly, you have your compound in your organic solvent. You add an aqueous solvent, mix the two vigorously. And if you've done this before, you know it can be quite a process and an arm exercise. And then you wait for the phases to settle and separate by gravity. Now choosing a solvent system, there's a few things to keep in mind again. Two solvents must be immiscible. Um, the analyte of interest must be soluble in your organic phase. The cost of um, the solvents, the toxicity, flammability and volatility of the solvent systems. So because in liquid liquid extraction, we tend to work with very large amounts of organic solvents, which is very often very volatile as well as flammable. It is very important to keep these um, aspects in mind um, as well, to keep them in mind when you're actually working in the lab as safety measures. So common solvent pairs that uh, we work with in liquid liquid extraction includes water dichloromethane, water ether, or water hexane combinations. Secondly, you'll have to be able to identify which layer um, you are working with. So um, whether your layer is going to be on the top or the bottom is dependent on the density of your solvents. Luckily, um, Thank, thank goodness for modern day technology and the internet, these densities are easily accessible online. So of course the one with the um, largest density will lie at the bottom and the lowest density will lie on top. So what is the advantages of liquid liquid extraction? It's a relatively simple method. It offers better cleanup than protein precipitation. It can be optimized for different compound classes, depending on the solvent systems that you're using. It can be used for solvent switching, and you can use large volumes if need be. The disadvantage, however, is that you require specialized glassware. You work with large organic volumes that can be dangerous. It is difficult to automate. There's often a formation of an emulsion between the two layers, making it very difficult uh, to separate and get um, the most compound out. It's not ideal for highly polar uh, compounds and sample handling is labor intensive and time consuming. So an answer to liquid liquid extraction is supported liquid extraction. So instead of working with two liquid phases, we will now be working with a solid phase and liquid phase, but based on the same principles as liquid liquid extraction. So it's gained quite a bit of popularity and high throughput laboratories where liquid liquid extractions are just too labor intensive and takes up too much time. Um, one of the big benefits over liquid liquid extraction is also that it eliminates the emulsion formation, uh, meaning less analyte getting lost in the middle layer. Traditionally supported liquid extractions are made of diatomaceous earth, which is a natural product made up of fossilized diatoms. Um, and this is used as sorbent during the extraction process. 
We have two options available um, from Phenomenics, the diatomaceous earth, which is the traditional um, version, and also a synthetic solvent, um, which is manufactured. Uh, there are some key differences between using a synthetic and um, a natural uh, solvent basis. So a few that I want to just point out is with a synthetic solvent, your lot to lot consistency and reproducibility is a lot better um, because it is consistently manufactured to certain specifications. Um, whereas with a diatomaceous earth, which is a natural product, the consistency um, is sometimes not that high, but it might be a bit more cost effective. The extraction solvents that you are able to use on each of these differ slightly, um, as well as the tube and plate formats. So generally, the diatomaceous earth offers you a bit of a larger volume to work with, whereas your synthetic solvent will be smaller volumes. How does it work? Quite simple. You saw, um, your sample are normally diluted in a buffer um, and loaded onto the diatomaceous solvent. The aqueous solvent will be left to soak into the solvent like a sponge. So you give it a few minutes and then you use your immiscible organic solvent, apply it to the solvent um, and your analyte of interest will partition into the organic solvent and be eluted from the plate. Interferences such as proteins, phospholipids and salts that interact with the aqueous phase remains on your plate um, and therefore you have a much cleaner sample at the end. The advantages of supported liquid extraction, also SLE, it does not require as much method development and time as SPE does. The method is fairly quick, it can be automated, it produces clean samples, reduces the risk of analyte loss due to emulsions, and can be used for solvent switching. The disadvantages is that it is less selective than SPE. Diatomaceous earth, um, as I mentioned, is a natural product found in mines across the world. So variance in this product um, can occur if it was obtained from different locations. And this also means that batch to batch cleanup uh, might mean not be that consistent. However, with synthetic SLE available, um, some of these have been answered and it is specifically engineered to overcome these variances and batch to batch consistency. Okay, so last question from my side. Have you ever used SPE? No. Uh, All right, 
So consensus looks like most people have not used SPE in the past, although I do see quite a few people have used SPE as well. So solid phase extraction. If you have used solid phase extraction, you would know it does take quite a bit of time and effort to optimize these results. Um, but it is a technique that ticks all the boxes of sample prep goals. It cleans up your sample, it concentrates your sample, and it can be used for solvent switching. So ultimately, um, putting a bit of effort into optimizing this as a method really can save you quite a lot of time and effort. It increases the recoveries as well as the robustness of your method, and it eliminates matrix effects. SPE can uh, be obtained in various formats, from single uh, cartridge tubes, 96 well plates, you can get bulk sorbent to pack your own cartridges or online cartridges. In order to use SPE, there is some uh, equipment that would be needed. So you can either go from a very simple uh, analysis where you use a single tube um, with a syringe and adapter cap and you can uh, manually put pressure on to um, press your sample through, or you can look at something like a vacuum manifold or positive pressure manifold uh, where you can analyze uh, quite a few samples at once. And for this, you will either need the vacuum um, manifold or positive pressure manifold and a vacuum pump or um, gas to apply positive pressure with. You can also go all out and automate SPE extraction um, quite easily. And for these, there are all kinds of platforms like the Hamilton Robotics range or online SPE that you connect directly onto your instruments. The basic workflow of SPE. So in quite a few cases, especially biological samples, sample pretreatment uh, would be recommended. And there is a list of pretreatment recommendations uh, ranging um, from um, simply um, changing the pH of your sample to filtering your sample before use, depending on your matrix. Uh, secondly, we want to condition our cartridges, and for this we generally use the strongest solvent that we are going to use. So whatever solvent that you are eluting with, we will condition our cartridges. Then we will equilibrate our car um, cartridges. So this is basically to remove that strong solvent, and you will use the um, solvent that your analytes are um, dissolved in for sample equilibration. You will then load your sample, wash um, with solvent to take out any interference, and lastly, elute um, with your strongest solvent to get your analyte um, of interest out. Now, there's different uh, options available in terms of media for sample per, um, SPE. Um, traditionally, uh, we worked with silica-based um, sorbents. This is still available, um, but there is also now polymer-based media. Now, the difference between these two are um, Firstly, the particle sizes available, as well as the pore sizes that we're working with here. This also then um, affects the surface area of each of these uh, types of media, and this will affect the amount of sample that can be loaded on each. For silica, the pH range is generally between 2 and 9, 
um, whereas the pH range for polymer based media is 1 to 14, allowing you a bit more room um, to optimize your method with. Now, the advantage of using traditional silica is that it is quite rigid, it's inexpensive, and it's easy uh, modifiable. The advantages of using polymer-based media is that it incorporates multiple modes of interaction um, into a single cartridge. It has a larger surface area, so you can load more sample. It is resistant to unconditioning, uh, which is often a problem with SPE, and it allows you a broader pH range. So um, just quickly to touch on unconditioning of um, your SPE. Um, so uh, some of the selectivities that are available in silica-based material like C18 um, needs to be conditioned. And when the cartridges run dry, um, we call it unconditioning, where uh, your phase might collapse and then you will have to recondition before you can continue. And often um, this can lead to some results being lost. So this is one advantage where uh, polymer-based media um, might be a better idea if you are quite new to SPE um, because it is resistant to unconditioning. And this is an example of some of the phases available um, in our polymer-based media. So um, traditional silica is our strata range. Um, our polymer is our strata X. And we also have a very new um, member to our SPE range. And this is called the strata X Pro. Now, it's based on the same uh, media as the strata X, so it's also a polymer-based media. But the difference is that no conditioning or equilibration steps are needed, and this can reduce your method time up to 40%. And here's a bit of an overview between the steps needed. So for traditional SPE, is, um, it's the steps that we already went through, and is generally a five-step procedure. Strata X Pro Rapid allows you to skip the conditioning and equilibration steps, leaving you with only three steps, um, whereas the Strata X Pro Super Express only contains two steps. So this will definitely help um, in sample throughput uh, in, in labs and it is also um, helps sort out a few problems with uh, conditioning and equilibration. Okay, so important information um, to know when you are looking for SPE is what is the sample matrix that you are working with. Um, what is the analyte and its properties that you are trying to isolate, and what is the sample volume that you want to work with? With these three questions, it can guide us to find the best SPE sorbent for your analysis. So firstly, we want to look at the sample matrix. The sample matrix, um, either aqueous or organic, will lead us to the best um, sorbent for your analysis. Aqueous sorbents um, sorry. So aqueous sorbents um, will lead you to either of these options. Organic is further divided into water miscible organics and non-water miscible organics and this will lead you to different phases. Next, the sample volume will determine the bed mass that you're going to work with. So this table is specific to Phenomenex products, but um, this should be available information from your um, 
from the company that you want to purchase from. So the different matrices that you are working with will need different sorbent, ma sorbent masses for the volumes that you are working with. I also want to point out here that polymeric material and silica material will have different um, loading capacities and therefore 100 microliters of, for instance, plasma, um, you can get away with 10 milligram of polymeric material, whereas with silica material, you will need at least 25 milligrams. So please keep this in mind when you are switching between silica based materials and polymeric materials that you cannot do a direct switch. Please make sure that the bed mass that you pick is optimal for your sample volume. Once we know uh, the bed mass that we are working with, we can also um, use this as a guide to uh, minimum wash steps and recommended um, volume wash steps. And this will um, help you to just uh, get a basic method up and running, which you can optimize from there. Some online tools to help with SPE analysis. Um, Chemicalize is a great website to get some of your um, properties, your analyte properties on. Uh, the Phenomenex SPE method development tool is a great website where you can have a, um, populate some of these um, properties of your analyte and it will give you a recommended SPE um, sorbent to try as well as the correct bed mass. And then lastly, there's quite a lot of SPE application notes available. So if you are struggling, please reach out um, to your representative. They should be able to assist. So in summary, there is quite a few different methods um, of sample prepar preparation available. Um, and they all differ in their specificity, whether it is to solve and switch, um, whether it is to clean up your sample or to concentrate your sample. And ultimately, you are going to have to decide um, what is the important aspects that you need to accomplish uh, your analysis and base your choice of sample preparation on that. Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I think we will open the floor for a few questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you are welcome to ask questions or to still type the questions into the chat box, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Hello. Hello. Yes, my name is Luke. Good morning, yeah, thanks Luke. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Yeah, I think it is. A, it is. A, it was nice to hear what is happening in this area, especially some areas that are new areas that are some development that is going on in, in some sample prep, especially like I liked the solid space extraction where. The new material where you can it cuts down the number of steps. I think that's a good one. But do you have them in stock? Those those sorbents. Uh, great. Um, I'm very glad you enjoyed the talk. And as long as um, there was something new to learn, I think we all uh, had a win. Um, I don't think with the COVID um, situation going on that these um, are in stock at the moment. However, I know they are available um, to import, so um, delays on them should be between two and four weeks. Or two and four weeks. 
Yes, yes. Unfortunately, yes, with the COVID situation, everything is a bit slower than usual. Um, but I yes. can ask one of the representatives to contact you if you would like more information. Yes, especially the <clears throat> in terms of applications, what type of compounds can it take, whether it takes a wide range of compounds with the different yes. priorities and so forth. I think that would be nice. Perfect. I'll make sure we send you a bit more information. Um, so it is based on the Strata X uh, material, which is a, um, has a, a non-polar interaction as well as a um, phenol group interaction. So it can be used with quite a variety of compounds. Okay. Okay, and also one last thing is, the, is it is it possible to send the, the the presentations maybe in PDF for those who want to have it because you see it was the, some of the slides on my side I could not see them I, I don't know. Oh goodness, I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, the I did record the session, so I can send you a recording of the session that is possible. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you so much. Any other questions? Right. Then I want to thank everybody for your time. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you do have any questions later on. Um, as I mentioned, this was recorded and I can share this afterwards. Marilise? Marilise, sorry. Yes. Um, I have one question here from Greg. He asks, can you please recap on the cartridge filtration for different solvents? Uh, sorry, can you just repeat that question? Okay, so he asked, um, can you please recap on the cartridge filtration for different solvents? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I'm understanding where we are. Okay, so we can... I think he was referred, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm assuming he's referring to the liquid-liquid or support of liquid extraction. Um, okay, he says, yeah, aqueous versus the solvent. Yeah, he's referring to the liquid, the support of liquid extraction. Okay, and um, solid filtration removal. Um, so, in terms of the supported um, extraction, the good extraction, um, it will depend, the organic solvent that you are using will depend um, a lot on the analytes of interest. So, you will have to make sure that your analyte of interest is soluble in that organic solvent. So, ultimately, you want to pull your um, and a lot of interest out of the water phase into the organic solvent. So um, it once again will have a lot to do with your analyte of interest. I'm not sure if that um, answers the question, sorry. I believe there was one more question. Um, I think that's it, Marilise. All right, perfect. Um, as I said, please, if uh, you think of a question later or there's something that you want more information on, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would love to hear from you and uh, Thank you for your time.
Okay, thanks a lot. Release.